Randy, the other lie is that they've created, they've set up more companies than any other government. More factories. Yes, more factories. Well, they are companies, Randy. Mm-hmm. Randy, that is also another lie. To begin with, Dr. Baumia and his boss, Anna Kufado, have not set up one company. All they have done is that they have attached themselves to people's companies. Randy, since 1997, there has been a government policy that gives tax incentives to anybody who wants to set up. And there have been hundreds of companies set up before Dr. Bamiya became vice president. Randy, I am able to tell you, if you give me the opportunity, I will recite 147 companies that were established between 2013 and 2017 January. Indeed, let me go ahead and tell you that at least 11 of the so-called one district, one factory projects that they tout were companies that we funded prior to the coming into office of the Bamiya administration. One of them is called Volta Forest Products Limited. Randy, as far back as 2010, we gave them 2.25 million Ghana cities. And they are into forest and timber products. There's another one called Fienza Industries Limited. They are based at Nkofo. Indeed, as for them, by 2002, they have received funding from the Kufo government. Aglo Farms Limited received 4.4 million Ghana cities in 2015. Yet they are captured on page 8 as a number 28 company on the list that they've shown as one day one factory uh, initiatives. Degan Farms Limited, they received a total of 3.8 million Ghana cities in 2018. They are based at Isogaman and they are into fish processing. They are number 35 on their list. Bibiani Logging and Timber and Lumber Company Limited, uh, Asamoa and Yamwa Farms Limited, they received 764,000 Ghana cities in 2013 from the NDC government to boost their operations. Home Foods Processing Limited received 1.7 million. Right? I could go on and on and on. Uh, so if you give me the opportunity, I will recite 147 companies for you. And when, on this program, I have showed you the sources. They are here. They are here. I'm not lying. I am challenging Dr. Bamiya directly to put out a list of everybody they say they've employed. They're so called 70,000. I am saying it is 216,000 based on the budget. And even that one, Randy, I have added the projection they made for 2021 in the budget statement. It's on Appendix 7 of the budget statement that uh, Honorable Chairman Sabuso read on behalf of Ken Ufoyata in March this year. So they must cut out the lies and stop thinking that Ghanaians are dollars and that they can say anything and get away with it. Right? Let me come to the visualization. You see, long before Dr. Bamiya was even picked by Nana Akufuadu to become his running mate, President Kufo had begun what we call the e-Ghana project, which essentially involved automating the services of public sector organizations. And all this noise about digitalization is about that. Essentially, government agencies are automating their services. And when I say that these are things that middle-level bureaucrats, at most, it is a minister, when I was deputy communications minister, some of those things, myself and Dr. Mani Supervisor, Dr. Atabwati, and before him, Mr. William Tebi, were in charge of it. It is nothing extraordinary that becomes the safe haven, the abode, the hideout for a vice president who has been battered by the economy and is seeking refuge. After President Kufo's e-government project in 2000, we came in and launched what we call the e-transform project. Randy, in May of 2014, we got $97 million from the World Bank to undertake this e-transform project. Look, I have the project document here. If you go between page 7 and page 18, they list the project components. All of them are part of the things that Dr. Bamiya goes touting that we've done. Indeed, when you talk of digitalization, essentially you, are, you want to leverage ICT opportunities to enhance services and promote transactions. There are two components. You lay down the infrastructure. That becomes the vehicle upon which these services ride. Let Dr. Bamiya show me any significant, they've made, significant investment they've made in even providing ICT infrastructure to ensure that they leverage on it. Randy, in Dr. Omani's article, he lists a lot of them, but I know you don't have that, so I won't go through all of them. Randy, from Accra to Boku, we laid a 1,000-kilometer fiber optic cable 
What happens is that in those corridors, they are underserved. And in many cases, mobile telephone companies don't like going there. So they call them last mile service areas. That cable passes through 20 districts. 100, sorry, 20 districts. Uh -huh, 120 communities. There are millions of people living there. If you go there today, it is this fiber optic cable that the telcos are leveraging on to provide data and voice service for people. And some, they have some of the fastest internet. Faster about, than some... What about the ones that are done by... There's an agency under... The NITA. NITA. Not NITA. There's Nita. another one where you have... Um, the likes of KNET go set up. Give it, give it. Yes, they I'll, set I'll up. Come to that. I'll come to that. Mm. So that was done. When you come to Accra and Tema, there's a 300 kilometer radius metro fiber, which ISPs, internet service providers, and telcos are leveraging on to provide data and voice services in Accra. Randy, we have what we call LTE 4GE sites. L LTE stands for long term evolution, 4G is fourth generation services. We built 120 of these sites in underserved communities. There are places where the telcos won't go. So in those places, there's internet service providers who render data services and allow people to make calls over data with using internet. 120 of them. I can give you the breakdown, but you don't have time. In addition to this, Randy, we have the biggest data center in the whole of West Africa. It's in that Ministry of Communications building at Ridge. Mm -hmm. About three floors on the, on the ground. There is a massive data center. It has 600 rack space. And it provides opportunity for finance companies, IT companies, insurance companies, to and public organizations to store massive data to avoid what we call a single point of failure. We did another one in Kumasi so that when this one fails, we can rely on it. When you come to the Accra Data Center, that is what we call a grade A plug and play facility. That creates opportunities for IT companies to set up, those into business process outsourcing and what have you. We did all of that. Over 70 enhanced community information centers were built so that people in remote communities who have never seen a laptop before can go there and have access to internet services. So this is a digital part, the infrastructure part. When you come to digital applications, there are three things. There is what you call government to government services. That basically involves networking government agencies. So because of the 120 LTE sites that we did, all these assemblies are connected. We provide 24-7 around the clock Wi-Fi services for them. Look, the Flagstaff House, almost all ministries and several agencies were connected because of that. Thing. That is the government to government service. We provide them domain names so that now they can have their own email identity. We provide wide area network services for them. There is also a second component called government to citizens and that is where the e-services comes in. Randy, in 2012, under the leadership of Honorable Harun Abisu, government launched the e-services platform which essentially allows a number of government agencies to render services online. So this passport application, a DVLA, applying for a license, applying for a birth certificate or a death certificate, applying to the police to do a background check or some DNA tests, uh, registering a company online at Registrar General were all available. On 17 December 2014, Mr. William Tebby, who was the, chair, uh, the Director General of NITA, he revamped that e-services platform and integrated it into the ep.gov.gh platform so that you, you not only access the service, but you can actually pay using credit cards, debit cards, you can use Momo. And for the avoidance of doubt, mobile money was introduced in Ghana in 2009. The interoperability service was underway. Dr. Bamiya cancelled it. We contend that his claims that there was inflation is a flat lie. And that there was no inflation. It is his usual pedestrian propaganda that led him to create the impression that if you have a BOT with somebody who is using his own resources to do something for you and recover it over time, the 1.6 below they mentioned is the entire output, outlay for operating that facility over the period of time that they went into that contract with the government of Ghana. So I dismiss that lie of inflation. He simply cancelled it and replaced it with another one. That is all. But it predates him. It is not his idea. It is not his vision. He didn't do zilch. He came to meet it. I used mobile money before Dr. Bamiya came to power. 
And indeed, into probability even existed elsewhere before he came to power. So it is nothing new, it is nothing unique, it is nothing peculiar. Now, back to the government services. So, if you notice, recently they went to launch this government e-services as if it was this. Randy, let me put it on record. It was launched on 17 December 2016. Indeed, sorry, 14. Seven clear years ago. Indeed, if you look at the very last page of the Green Book, which would be page 211, this is it. We list, I don't know whether your camera can capture it. We list it's all captured. the services. We list all the services there. Randy, how would we have known one whole year before Bamiya became vice president that we were going to do e services? So this is not appropriation. We did it. At best, he can say that they have enhanced the features there, which is normal. It is great. There's no problem. But no impression should be created that indeed he has done something novel. Randy, again, under this e services bit, we have the e governance component. And that is where e transform comes in. So under e transform, there were a number of things that were to be done. Randy, we have something like e procurement, e justice, e cabinet, e health, e workspace, and e parliament. In 2019, I think sometime in May 2019, Dr. Bamiya went to launch the e procurement bit. Randy, read the story. Read the story that accompanies it. The story makes it clear that this e-procurement thing is the World Bank $97 million project that started in 2014. So it is not Dr. Bamiya's handiwork. He came to meet it. He only went to inaugurate it. When he came into power, there were commitments that had been made by the government of Ghana with the World Bank to do this. All the money that was used for it, this particular e-procurement bit cost $5 million. It didn't come from Dr. Bamiya. I heard him saying that all the things he has done have been financed by the private sector. That is not true. The e procurement bill cost $5 million. It was financed by the World Bank under our e transform project. Nana Kufuado, President Kufuado, I beg your pardon, also went to launch the e justice system in March 2020, sorry, in March 2019. Randy again read the story, read the speech of the Chief Justice. She made it clear that this is a project under the e transform project, the e justice component. I think that one cost about $6 million or so. Indeed, before the e transform, we had already done some work that made it possible for the judiciary to have teleconferencing facilities so judges could interact with each other across regions under e health randy kolebu kolebu polytechnic the zebula district hospital the wild regional hospital were taken through a pilot project after which contracts were awarded for implementation Maybe they can give us an update of where that is that one too for the avoidance of doubt is a direct result of the e transform project Randy, E cabinet. And this one I know because there were occasions that I represented my boss in cabinet. At least 20 cabinet sessions were held under this E cabinet arrangement where we didn't have to take tons of documents to cabinet. E parliament. You can go to parliament and ask them when the E parliament arrangement began. What we call a software requirement specification had been done long before they came to power. And then there is what we call e-workspace to make sure that government agencies don't need tons of documents to operate. This was done. And several ministries, including the communication ministry where I used to work, uh, Registrar General, Control and Accountant General, all those agencies were brought under this particular project. So there is nothing unique, original, extraordinary about migrating government agencies to provide online services. And there's a clip that I gave to your producers, and I, I hope that they play it. This claim that they were the ones who had introduced online application for passports is completely false. And on 20th December 2016, Honorable Hanateke, then Foreign Minister, launched that initiative. And I have the story here. It is right here, and this one is carried by the Daily Graphic. Online passport application launched. There's actually a video clip, that is it, of her. It's just two minutes. Listen to it. In line with Ghana's e government strategy, the service is seen as a solution to the existing difficulties bedeviling passport acquisition in the country. It is also expected to ensure efficiency and reliability in passport acquisition. The online
online passport application project was introduced in 2014 through the National Information Technology Agency's pilot. The introduction of the Ghana Biometric Passport replaces all non-biometric passports by the end of 2017. The launch is the culmination of the process adopted by the government to reform the delivery of travel documents for Ghanaians across the country. According to the technical advisor of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration, Ambassador Leslie Christian, who doubles as the chairman of the Online Passport Application Project Committee, Applicants can make payment for the process through EcoBank, Zenith Bank, GCB Bank, Mobile Money Transfer via Vodafone, MTN, and Airtel, as well as their payment cards. Foreign Minister Ms. Hannah Teta said the system will help the ministry deliver the highest levels of customer integrity and international standing of the Ghana passport while improving on the security and issuance system. Depending on a range of factors, we are aiming for the following delivery deadline. A maximum of 15 working days for a standard application and then a maximum of 5 working days for express applications. In due course, it is anticipated that the Ministry would introduce a premium 24-hour passport delivery service to cater for the Ghanaian business community and frequent flyers. Ms. Teta said the service will be expanded across the country by establishing passport application centers in six regions. And I'm, I'm optimistic that given the amount of progress that has been made in that regard already, very soon we should see that every region of the country has a passport application center. The online application service is expected to help reduce the involvement of middlemen in the passport acquisition process, reduce typographical errors, and shorten the data capturing procedures, as well as speed up the workflow for the passport processing and improve passport service delivery. Right, yes. So, so, that was it. Yeah. so at best, you mm -hmm. can say that you have enhanced what you came to meet. Mm -hmm. Just like we enhanced what we came to meet, President before do. If you want to ensure that the ports are automated, it is okay. If you want to ensure that now you can sit in your home and buy medicine, it is okay. If you want to ensure that there's a national ID system, I mean, indeed, that national ID system started under President Kufo. Randy, the contracts that they are using were contracts they came to meet the NDC had entered into. There were attempts to but do you, a national... You also, like you alluded to, you also met some that... Absolutely. By Randy, by that's why I have been candid to tell you that this whole digitalization process mm. began much earlier. Mm. There was something called e-government. I'm sure if you speak to those who were in Mr. Kufo's cabinet, they, they will be able to shed more light on it. So I will not come and sit here and pretend that even though perhaps we did the largest chunk of the work, the government before us didn't know anything. And that, and yes, I had a most, a most bizarre and ridiculous claim, unfortunately from my friend Kodu Oponkuma that before Dr. Bamiya, nobody was championing digitization. And I didn't understand exactly what he meant. So that if you go and mount a platform on Ashesi, speak to impressionable students, and target a certain section of the populace with misleading claims, that is when you have championed digitization. But if you do all the things that I've outlined, you haven't championed digitization. What kind of propaganda, what kind of politics is this? So yes, Randy, digitization offers convenience. And that is a watchword, convenience. But it does not replace the work that has to be done to manage the economy properly. It does not replace the work that has to be done to ensure that people can afford basic goods and services. At the moment, people cannot afford it. And all indications are that it is going to get worse because of the mess Dr. Bamiya supervised last year, which has led us into this economic crisis. When you go to the pump, Randy, to buy fuel, the fact that you can pay through mobile money hasn't made the fuel cheaper. It is expensive when people are crying. When you go to a restaurant to eat, you can pay for your food through mobile money. Randy, I also haven't been to the bank in a while because I use the mobile banking application. But it hasn't made my payments cheaper. It has not made the cost of fuel more affordable to me than it was. It hasn't made the cost of getting by more affordable than it was. So let them tone down on this rhetoric. And I can assure them, Randy, that there's absolutely no way that Dr. Bamiya will be allowed to run away from the terrible economic disaster he has supervised. And let me tell you, Andy, if you look at the indicators that we took to the IMF program in 2014, it is far better than the indicators we have today. And the likes of uh, Dr. 
Kisli Nyaku, Oko Boy, Dr. Bami and Ku. Who like to recite all those economic indices? Really, there are about 18 economic indices. 18 of them. It is not all of them that are very relevant for the discussion. The key ones, Randy, is your deficit. As for economic growth, and indeed, most of the time, many of the things that contribute to economic growth are actually out of our hands. Because economic growth is not just government activity. It is true that government would ensure the environment that allows the economy to grow, even if there is private sector contribution. But many of them are out of our hands. Today, if our commodity prices crash, and when COVID came, Randy, the economy went to 0.7, the worst in 38 years, the worst in 38 years. Dr. Bamiya cannot claim to be a superior economist when he has supervised the worst economy in 38 years. Mm. When that happens, your economy will tank. But when it comes to the deficits and borrowing, mm. which are the biggest problems contributed to the loss of confidence in this economy? And Randy, I repeat, loss of confidence. It is a scathing indictment on Dr. Bamiya that people don't have confidence in this economy. Those two are within your control. It is simply your expenditure mm. a- against your revenue. Mm. When your revenue takes a hit, you look at your expenditure so that you align them. In our yeah. daily life, Randy, if you spend far more than you earn, you will be in perpetual debt and you are not managing your country, your life properly. Mm. It is the same for the economy. You decide what you spend and how you earn. So what you spend must depend on what you earn. If you are earning low revenues because of COVID, and somebody has come to support you with all this money. Look, the Bank of Ghana gave them 10 billion Ghana cities. Never happened in our history. Mm-hmm. They got 2 billion. 2 billion is 11 billion from the World Bank. They had access to our stabilization fund, about 200 million dollars. They got about 200 million dollars also from the World Bank and other uh, sources. Mm-hmm. And they were given a pass on many, 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 many things. Look, when they are not giving the money, they didn't attach any conditions because of COVID. Mm-hmm. So if you have all this revenue, you manage it such that you don't go into a hole, especially knowing that because of COVID, your revenues have dwindled. Mm-hmm. But they put us in the hole that will take four years to get out of. Four mm-hmm. years mm-hmm. to get out of. And they don't want to take the hard decision. Look, Randy, they had an opportunity in 2019, which was made available again in 2020. They call it the DSSI, the Debt Service Suspension Initiative, which meant that if they had gone, and it's an IMF program, if they had gone, the IMF